This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. So uh, the last session, I'm going to start with the, with the last paper uh, by Frank Ferenbach. He teaches at uh, Harvard. Before that, he was in Florence and also in Rome. And uh, people tell me um, that he's uh, run, written tremendous works on, uh, on, uh, on, on Leonardo. And, uh, but apparently he's very worried about the redating that happened just before. <laughs> <laughs> so, Frank. So friendly. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter, for the invitation and also for the wonderful opportunity to see the exhibition this morning, hopefully again. Um, I realize this is again the, the basic difference between um, an art historian and someone who can act, uh, organize an exhibition. You're actually able to make people happy, right? <laughs> um, and I will continue in this uh, uh, venerated tradition with a paper which is particularly abstract, I'm afraid. Um, in the first paragraph of his unabridged, posthumously edited Phyllis on painting, written circa 1500 to 1505, Leonardo claims that painting is a science, scientia, because like geometry, it is founded on an ultimate principle, ultimo principio, the point. Therefore, the point is the first principle of geometry. And no other thing can exist either in nature or in the human mind that would be more fundamental than the point. It was another principle. If you were to say that the creation of a point is the final contact made with the point of a stylus on a surface, this is not true. You would say such contact is a surface that surrounds the center, and in that center is the location of the point. All the points of a surface, even of the world, would not create more than a single point, Leonardo continues. The point is not materially part of the picture surface. Non è della materia di essa superficie. Nevertheless, it mysteriously creates the image. By comparing the point to zero, Leonardo seems to equate the point to nothing. But the fact that the addition of zero, as Leonardo put it, changes the value of numbers from 1 to 10 to 100 ad infinitum, provides an analogy to the dynamic quality of the point, namely its extensions into line and surface on a picture plane. Lines and surfaces are created by the transit of the point, la linea e il transito del punto. Consequently, lines and surfaces also have no extension. They are, quote, Leonardo again, something spiritual rather than substantial. The point is thus intimately connected to, to movement and therefore to Leonardo's categories of physics. And I would like to come back to this issue later and hopefully also in the discussion. In the light of the apparently abstract quality of the point, Leonardo's bold assertion that painting is mental, la pittura è mentale, comes as little surprise. Yet it is nevertheless only one side of the coin. Leonardo also emphasizes again and again the importance of visuality, leaning strongly towards an identification of sensory activity as a mental activity per se, thereby circumventing the traditional hierarchy between outer and inner senses. However, as is well known, Leonardo remar Leonardo's remarks on the point as an invisible principle of painting contrast significantly with those of Alberti, Filarete, and Pio della Francesca. All three authors describe the first element of painting as a visual point, as the smallest perceptible element on the picture surface. Alberti categorically denies the relevance of invisible entities for any discourse on painting. The beautiful triple negation, quote, nobody would argue against the fact that the things we cannot see are irrelevant for the painting. <laughs> Following the Aristotelian tradition, Piero da Francesca calls the point a product of human imagination, the imaginativo. Leonardo instead seems to closely follow the authority of Euclid, 
who defines the point at the very beginning of his elements as oh, that which has no part in God. But the paradox in Leonardo's argument is obvious. Identifying the first principle of painting as a mathematical point seems to be a negative answer to the question which Leonardo posed in the aforementioned passage as to whether or not painting is a science. He writes, quote, that mental discourse is termed science that originates in first principles beyond which nothing else can be found in nature as part of this science, end quote. Later on in the same paragraph, Leonardo once again relates mathematics to nature or visibility, emphasizing that all the sciences have to be transparent to mathematical demonstrations. However, only those that do not begin and end in the mind, but are based on sensory experience, are true sciences. The question is, how can an abstract quality like the point be part of nature? and therefore belong to sensory experience. By a series of fascinating meditations that can be dated around 1505-8, as most of us know, the most interesting, fascinating part of the entire life of Leonardo as an intellectual, 1505-8, to the most restless part also of his life, and which are found mostly in the Codex uh, Arundel, the British Museum, Leonardo struggles with the paradoxical properties of point and nothing. At the end of this breathtaking intellectual exploration, Leonardo defines the point as a third liminal entity between nothing and something. Quote, nothing can be called smaller than the point, and it is the common border term of naught and line. It is neither naught nor line, and it does not occupy any space between naught and line. Therefore, the end of nothing and the beginning of the line are in contact, but not connected. And in this contact, the point is the divider between the continuity of naught and line. There is not an identity, but an intimate relationship, therefore, between point, the infinitely small, and naught. It is striking that whenever Leonardo tries to establish a complex and dynamic relationship of identity and difference, for instance, among the four powers in nature, force, movement, gravity, and percussion, or between painting and music, whenever he tries to establish this uh, relationship of difference and identity, he refers to metaphors of kin. Quote, Therefore, the end of nothing and the beginning of line are in contact, but not conjointed. And in this contact is the point. Of this point, naught is the brother." End quote. The point ensures, to put it somewhat differently, <coughs> continuity and discontinuity at the same time. As the extension of the point, the surface itself oscillates between nothing, pure absence, and something. Quote, air is conjoined with water, this is Leonardo's favorite example, and the end of the one is shared with the other, so that one, one can say they are continuous, a continuous quantity, because they are joined or glued together, applicate, and discontinuous, because they are of two natures." End quote. However, by, by defining the point as the infinitely small, divided smallest unit in nature, a unit that constitutes the irreducible core of lines, surfaces, and bodies, and by ultimately reducing all positive data to one single point, Leonardo had to face the collapse of the part and the whole of naught and infinity. Quote, all the um, things that <coughs> occupy nothing, I paraphrase, are equal among themselves, um, and each is equal to all. So that we can say, in this case, the part is equal to the whole, and the whole to the part, and the divisible to the indivisible, and the finite to the infinite. 
So uh, therefore, um, in this case, um, therefore, uh, for that which we which we just said, which I just said, surface line and point are nothing because they don't occupy any space. They don't occupy anything, um, and all the nothings uh, are equal to uh, the whole and the whole to one as is proven in arithmetic. Uh, the body is uh, clothed in um, plural uh, 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 surfaces and the surfaces are surrounded by, lean, by lines and the lines are terminated by points. Leonardo conceived of the point as a liminal entity between something and nothing. An entity that not only ensures continuity and discontinuity, but actively, and that's the important thing, in atto, oscillates between the two states. In other words, at the core of physical reality, an immanent principle, the point, constantly works against non-dimensional unity in an effort to achieve multitude, difference, and also, simultaneously, wears down the distinctions and plurality of the three-dimensional world. The point is, in this view, the chief agent of the continuous drama of a world that con contracts into the infinitely small, that collapses into the principle of unity, and that originates, re-emerges at every infinitely small moment of time and at every infinitely small point of transparent space that we'll see. It is through his identification of the point with the principle of movement that Leonardo reintegrates nothingness and nature in her capacity for transformation. In the point, as a principle of every process, nature dies away and is reborn continuously. Without not, objects in the world would not be differentiated from one another but without not, movement would also be impossible. The classic Epicurean argument already emphasized that there would be no space for change if void did not separate the positive data of objects and patterns. But Leonardo's approach is more complicated and risks even more contradictions. At the beginning of his subsequent investigation to this concept, Leonardo clarifies the identity between point and moment line and ispazio di tempo. Since it has no surface or body, time is not a continuous quantity, but is instead comparable to point and line, and therefore one-dimensional. Time is the result of the movement of nothing, the point of pure presence, the instant comparable to the movement of the point creating the line. No instante non ha tempo, el tempo è causato dal mondo dello instante. In the continuum of time, the point of the instant works as the connecting and separating unity between past and future, which are also nothing. As all of you know. And the philosophers of the tradition, starting with Augustine, are underlined. Implicitly critical of his own earlier attempt to ground the Shenzhou of painting in the principle of the point as an invisible entity. Leonardo continues, quote, the point is nothing, but on the nothing one cannot build up any chance, any null. And to avoid this principle, we will say, nothing can be smaller than the point, smaller. And the line is created by the movement of the point, and its ends are two points, and the surface is generated by the transversal movement of the line, and the body is created by movement. We call it fundamental. But the converse, the converse of the argument also holds. In the latter case, privation, which is nothing in action, reduces the dimensionality of bodies, surfaces, etc. As will soon become clear, this understanding of a gradual negation as a privation of dimensions determines Leonardo's description of major processes in nature as well as his interpretation of the painter's creation. In contrast to the opposition between space that is filled and the empty space within a vacuum, nothing and something are everywhere gradually connected by the infinitely small. Quote, 
this is perhaps the most beautiful of the, of the, of this line of meditations, where nothing ends, the thing is born. And where the thing disappears, nothing emerges. The relationship of naught and things does not dissolve in a simple teleology, God's creatio ex nihilo, from nothing to being as the most powerful paradigm. But Leonardo conceives it as a continuous oscillating, ambivalent process open to both directions. Leonardo's point is, in other words, the power of transition itself, a liminal entity connecting and dividing, a paradoxical being, the all-pervasive one, a motor that works against its own integrity, identical with itself only through permanent self-transcendence. And at this juncture, this would, of course, be useful to situate Leonardo's paradoxical notion of point and naught in the extended history of the idea of nothing. Indeed, it would be especially interesting to outline the implicit non-indifference of naught, the concept of an absence that awaits its transition into presence, or in other words, the history of the dynamics of the void. There's no time for this. Part of this prehistory of Leonardo's thought has been beautifully exemplified by someone whom I would describe as the most inspiring and most knowledgeable of all interpreters of Leonardo the philosopher, and that's Fabio Ferrosini of uh, Urbino University. And instead, I would like to make, uh, give you a few, very few remarks about um, um, Leonardo's, I think, spectacularization of the point. Um, on Cortex Arundel uh, 132 Recto, at the end of a long discourse about the identity of all the points in the world. And I'm talking about this um, set of diagrammatic uh, sketches at the very end of the left page, bottom. He starts at the, on the right hand side and does not exemplify, but I think the sequence is so revealing and so fascinating. He starts with something that we described that all the infinite intersecting lines of a circle or concur in one point. This would be the movement from uh, the first to the uh, uh, diagram to the second from right, uh, right to left. And then he continues with something like an assumption that the um, multitude of angles created by these lines are all terminated by a point, uh, which is the same, again, um, and all of these angles in the end are therefore nothing. Um, this would be exemplified by this sketch, which shows again the point as a graphic element on uh, the page, on the paper. And then an interesting, very interesting uh, diagram follows with an empty space in the middle and uh, the notion for nulla as an N. And then the most spectacular of all of these diagrams ends the whole discourse. Um, and this is something that um, I would describe as a representation of the point that, that is shown as something that distorts in the end the positiveness of space. The intersection of lines is not there at some determined point. This is presence of nulla in the world, I would say, if nothing, but only as an infinitely small um, uh, uh, um, uh, element. There's no positive localization. We could continue to read this in, um, in a perspective of, of, for instance, Leibniz, and insert another circle in the middle, and then we would have um, an idea about the relationship between tangent, uh, 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 tangential um, uh, um, uh, 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 approaches to um, uh, to the infinite, the infinitely small space. One consequence of Leonardo's meditations on punto and nulla is quite obvious. Without the infinitely small point as a transitional element between being and non-being, there would be no distinction between objects in nature, but also no multitude in the visual fields. Field objects would be indistinguishable and therefore invisible. Only nothing, the inter interference, the, the permeation of nothing <coughs> in the world allows for the possibility of vision, distinction. At the same time, it's true that no thing is really visible because of the invisible nature and the lack of extension and quality in points. 
the final constituents of bodies and time. The major impact of this idea on art and representation in general cannot be underestimated. It also dominates Leonardo's scientific thought, which extends to optics, hydrogeology, and physics. In each of these fields, which mark the center of Leonardo's besides anatomy, um, of, of in these years, um, um, 1505, 1508, in each of these fields, the notion of the point is structurally linked to dramatic processes in nature. The reversible action of the point, again, creating extensions and establishing at the same time the presence of nothing, of an absence in nature, leads to oscillations between being and non-being on a cosmological scale. In each case, the point appears as a motor of transition, as a transitional entity through which difference collapses and is marvelously recreated. And I have to limit myself here to a few remarks about optics. Very on passant hydrogeology and painting and we start with optics. How is the point related to optics? And this um, continues, I think, quite nicely what uh, continues what Francesca quite nicely uh, um, started to talk about this morning. How is the point related to optics? Perspective and its reliance on the transformation of three-dimensional bodies into punctiform marks on the window pane, a Gertian window pane of the picture surface, played a fundamental role in Leonardo's theory of painting. Leonardo reconceptualized Alberti's main goal, the description of a constructive device for painters, by interpreting perspective as a fundamental phenomenon of nature itself. Uh, quote, the eye does not see if not in a pyramidal way uh, pers the, the perspective of painters without pyramid has no uh, place, has no uh, raison d'etre, non a loco, end quote, beginning for example. As two-dimensional images of three-dimensional objects, the simulacra become in the end, in the apex of the visual pyramid, and are reduced to points. Undeniably, the whole process has a sublime character, activated by light objects emit images of their true form that diminish at every point across the transparent medium. The semiosis of nature, as I feel tempted to say, the permanent communication of forms in space, the fundamental mechanism of every lit object to flood space with images of itself creates countless regularly diminishing simulacra of surface forms, an ocean of visual, visible points. So the air, the pure air uh, is able to receive in itself without any interval of time every image of, uh, of bodies, um, every single part of the air uh, receives in itself all the species that are perfect, um, exposed to it or in front of it without any um, interval of time. The particular nature of these points and of their relationship to the optical process concerned Leonardo for many years and after what we've heard uh, this morning, we'd say from the 1470s already because the earliest diagram of the eye already alludes to that kind of um, of deep reflection in Leonardo. In his early texts on optics, the center point of the eye became the point of reference for the establishment of the distance between eye and object, the distance point of perspective, a mobile point hit by image points in space, the place where the shapes and colors of objects are transformed into perception. However, Leonardo's labor in his later optical studies, conducted after 1500, Leonardo realized that there would be no perception of magnitudes if the place of perception were in the end a non-dimensional point. This is an argument that motivated already our Hazen to speculate about the complex refractions caused by the complicated layers, spheres, and densities of the eye. The site where three-dimensional objects transform into perception must therefore necessarily be extended an argument that blurs the mathematical simplicity of perspective, 
and contributes decisively to Leonardo Sharp's critique of perspectivists in the years around 1500. Leonardo's struggle for an alternative model included the traditional hypothesis that the virtu visiva should be located at the surface of the eye or at the front surface of one of its humors, that is, before the rays intersect in a point. However, since nature produces nothing in weighing, <coughs> how could this solution explain the complicated structure of the eye? Aristotle had already posed the same question. Relying strongly on medieval optical texts like those by Roger Bacon and John Peckham, Leonardo had to accept that the eye's apparatus redirected the visual rays. During the very same years of his reflections on point and nothing, Leonardo felt more and more convinced that the most important side of perception, or part of the perception of the eye that must be related to perception, was the rear part of the organ, the place where the optical nerve penetrates the eyeball. But how could this observation be reconciled with the intersection of the visual rays in the eye's transparent humoris? The major problem was the necessarily inverted projection of the species in the rear part of the eye, a la camera obscura, Al Hazen's and Roger Bacon's main argument against the intersection of rays. Another was quite inventive in overcoming this apparently dead end, which was only accepted some 100 years later, um, as you all know by Johannes Kepler. He postulated a double intersection of the rays or a plurality of intersections in order to rectify the projected image for some time even speculating on a first intersection in front of the eye caused by the reflection at flash and lip. In all of these observations and thought experiments, however, <coughs> one thing remained undisputed. The fact that a two-dimensional image is one or several times reduced to a point. The infinitely small transition between body and not. In a text that tries hard to differentiate between natural and mathematical point, the text that can be dated around 1508 again, Leonardo states, quote, all the minimal parts of the species penetrate each other without occupying the others. So that we can conclude that the surface reduces itself to a point. The projected image emissions of objects within the eye pass through a non-dimensional point. Thus the self-images that nature paints proceed through nothing. The optical process reveals itself as a proof of the point's presence <coughs> in nature, a majestic, continuous spectacle of loss and rebirth of dimension, form, and beauty, an oscillation between being and non-being a permanent model for the fictional character of art, a model in nature for the fictional character of art. The optical process provided a sublime paradigm for some of Leonardo's most intimate poetic lines, written at about the same time as his late studies of point and eye. It is no coincidence that these lines paraphrase a passage in Lucretius' long poem on atoms and void, called, look at the light and consider its beauty, Close your eye and look at it again. What you see of it was not before, and what has been is not anymore. Who makes it anew when its cause, space the flame, continuously dies? Now, I'm not so sure that you didn't take the time. Um, if I, perhaps I paraphrase it very quickly. In hydrogeology, at about the same time, the manuscript F1508, something extremely fascinating can be observed, which is very close to this oscillation or this process of the loss of extension or altitude in a point and the re-emergence of something that would, we could call a line or body is extension and dimensionality. It's when Leonardo was uh, obsessed with the idea of the Earth's transformation by the uh, continuous activity of fluids of air and water erosion and when he started to speculate um, following late uh, scholastic authors like Albert of Saxony um, and Jean Buridan about the future of the Earth in which the um, irregularity of the Earth's surface would be leveled, um, the elements would be 
uh, uh, leveled in, 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 in all their purity, the whole mass of the earth would be covered by water because the mountains would be uh, leveled completely. And at this point, something interesting uh, occurs, which already haunted these late scholastic authors, something that Martin Kemp called an art concept, the idea that God at the beginning providentially separated the point of magnitude, the center of magnitude of the Earth, and the center point of its gravity, so that there's a continuous disequilibrium on, on Earth that would uh, um, guarantee life, multiplicity variations. At, in, at the very moment when the, the activity of erosion comes to its end, the, level, the, the elements are uh, perfectly level, the two points will merge. It would be a single point moment in which, as Leonardo concludes, all the terrestrial life would be uh, would come to its end. The death of animal life on Earth, on the solid Earth of the Earth. But then, if you look uh, carefully at uh, the argument of manuscript F, he continues to speculate about what's going on next, and that would be, um, especially because of the uh, agency of sun and moon, again something like a disequilibrium potential continuous movement the equatorial seas would be higher than the northern and southern seas um, they would then uh, stream down flow down to other parts and would create some sort of a continuous movement on the surface of these waters the discourse stops at this point but it's quite evident that leonardo must have had something in mind that he could describe as a new disequilibrium which, which would separate again the two points and create again something like land masses or whatever islands. Um, so that even on a macroscopic or hydrogeological level, the, the point is that that, that, kind, that kind of merging of extension into one point would only be a point of transition and diversity would follow everything. Um, let me conclude now with painting. It is important to realize that what appears to be a mere mind game on Leonardo's part establishes not only optics, hydrogeology, even impetus physics, as I would argue, but also painting itself as a paradigm and continuation of the most fundamental paradox <coughs> in nature a paradox with dynamic implications. Leonardo's style is what first comes to mind. No stylistic trait is more characteristic of Leonardo than the blurred boundaries and transparent substances of his soft bodies and surfaces, with almost his almost weightless draperies and vaporous atmospheres. Sfumato can indeed be related to Leonardo's observations regarding the complexity of the visual process particularly in relation to his optical treatise, the manuscript. <coughs> Leonardo inherited the standard conviction of traditional optics, namely that only the centric ray emitting from or reaching to each eye establishes a sharp perception of the object's true form. However, following his ideas about the paradoxical status of the point and the non-existence of contour lines, Leonardo went on to challenge this formula around 1508. Okay. Leonardo came to understand the line of the centric ray as a liminal entity, <coughs> a continuity of more or less sharp perceptions. More importantly, Leonardo observes that this liminal entity oscillates continuously in order to scan the object's boundaries and internal differentiations of detail. Fumato exaggerates the fact that physical boundaries are nothing. Paradoxical entities connecting and disconnecting bodies and their surroundings. In this revolutionary view, nothing, the centric ray of the eye, meets nothing, the contours of objects. Or we should perhaps say, two brothers of nothing meet, creating a dynamic field of gradual differentiation and the negation of any positive location of forms. But Leonardo goes further. As we have seen, he defines the utmost principle of painting 
as the infinitely small point that creates the line. Every single point of the picture surface is marked by the point, therefore, by this paradoxically identical element of transition, just as one identical punctiform soul permeates the entire body. Leonardo's formula for the optical process comes to mind, tutto per tutto, e tutto uh, in ogni parte, uh, which is a direct uh, uh, um, uh, um, um, translation, uh, 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 transposition of the traditional formula of the soul, which is in every single part of the body as a whole. Tutto per tutto, e tutti, tutto in ogni parte. Leonardo discovered one of the most fascinating principles of pictorial representation, namely that every point of the picture plane is at the same time a positive element on a surface, a pigment, and transparent to the fictive appearance of represented objects, figures, atmospheres, etc. There's something and nothing at the same time. In contrast to our Sculpture. The material element of color is thus added to a material surface in order to transgress material factualness to become nothing as it were. And you remember this um, uh, definition of the point in painting, non è della materia di essa superficie, it is not part of the matter of the such, uh, uh, super surface. This becomes even more evident if the depicted surfaces are themselves almost nothing, like Leonardo's favorite objects of the Paragon and its sculpture, water, animals, dust, mist, etc., or the transitional states of movement. To conclude, the creations of the painter originate in the movement of the point, leading to visual forms on the picture surface, visible points, lines, surfaces. One of Leonardo's texts begins, Fa che quando ritrai e che tu muovi alcun principio di linea, if you start, if you, if you portray something, if you imitate something, and move the principle of line, and it goes on, that's already next to A, thereby locating the point precisely at the inception of the pictorial act. The transition from naught to being embraces in this perspective the paradigm of creatio ex nihilo, and therefore complements Leonardo's definition of the painter as signore e dio of his creations. Thank you very much. on Aristotle's categories, yeah. on the category of quantity. You quite often would get a fairly simple um, sort of summary and then questioning about those basic paradoxes about point, surface, right. and line. Right. That, um, and, and I don't know if that would have been a source for him. It might perhaps have been an easier source than, 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 than some of the other things. No, certainly. I mean, uh, Fabio Fossini goes back to this entire bunch of, uh, and nothing of it is in the end original, right? Yes. You see, uh, the original thing uh, uh, would perhaps be, I'm, I'm not so sure about this, uh, would perhaps be something that we could call an early stage of topological thinking or something that has to do with the infinitesimal calculus. Uh, the idea that there is something in nature which is infinitely small and not just an, an abstraction, right? Um, but that's something I'm absolutely not familiar with. The original uh, part of it, I think, of the is that um, you must have found uh, this uh, uh, deeply connected to both the optical process and the act of painting, right? 
Uh, and that would have, again, privileged both activities or processes, and it would have been a strong argument, again, for this um, lifelong obsession with the idea of painting uh, as uh, the, fun the fundamental uh, cultural activity, the fu fundamental language, as an extension of something which more or less sublime, majestically char characterizes nature itself. That was a fascinating video. But um, what I was wondering is, is um, the so often in earlier treatises, the that are geometrical, they separate um, pure point line right. plane from the measurement. Um, but then in Pliny, you have the competition of Apelles, where Apelles shows his palace as an artist by drawing lines and things about measure. And I'm wondering if there's any mention in the other of that as a, a, a that sort of model of an artist's act being the same as that of the intellect, which can generate um, these forms in the mind, being <coughs> able to transfer that onto the canvas. Um, I, I don't think that there's any, that someone knows, any explicit uh, 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 reflection on that, but. I mean, if, if, you, if you follow the argument of the line of utmost subtlety, right, uh, you would quite naturally end up with something that would even be more invisible or smaller. And at some point, sfumato could be an overcoming for the line of Apelles, right? because it would even fit into the smallest uh, possible line. That's an interesting idea. I'm going to how you can translate the Leonardo's use of the word sheerness, sheerness. Mm -hmm. When you consider the English, the contemporary English language, um, the strictness of the word, compared with the Latin language. Yeah. Um, well, um, and that's it's beautifully um, uh, developed, interpreted by Claire Farrak, or uh, uh, I think. It's in the end quite traditionally the idea that uh, shensia is um, um, a practice that is informed by rules, right? Basically, so by by by, by abstract rules, but it's a practice. It's uh, it's um, it's um, uh, it's not theoretical. Um, I suppose I'm still wrestling with the idea way in which these observations can be transformed into metaphor within the context of relational mm -hmm. imagery. Because obviously, you know, I was pleased that you the question you tried to come off and yeah. stay until the very end. Um, that, that you talked about the, the soul, and, mm -hmm. and I also wrote about the mystery of the incarnation and something that you think is something that you can do with the visible. And in particular, I think it's one way we get very far from the faculty about the vanishing um, of the last <coughs> supper um, and mm -hmm. the beauty of the lines at the head of Christ. It's obviously a, a, a very key moment. And I was wondering if you could speculate on the way in which, uh, which these people would, would, would point as sort of the potatoes would beautifully describe from, from something to nothing. Um, I'm, I'm almost as, as, as hesitant to answer the question as you were uh, decisive <laughs> uh, and, and rigorous to, uh, to postpone it. But that's uh, so. I mean, if you if you um, Leonardo's language in these years, the way he, he uses chemical language to, uh, to describe something which is apparently just a mathematical mind game, um, is of course reminiscent of, of, of meditations on nothing. For instance, I would say in, uh, in negative theology or mystical thought, 
and the whole traditions started at least with Corpus and then continued with uh, Master Eckham and so on. And, and in, in, in all of these, uh, the, uh, it's not just the paradox that comes up, but it's uh, the, um, uh, how should we call it, kind of the, 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 the pregnancy of nothingness, of the void. A kind of superabundance of the other, which is <coughs> apparently becomes purely visible. But um, I would object to read it as, uh, as, at least as I understand, metaphor or sign as just something that can be uh, uh, codified, right? that can be cracked as uh, conventional or whatever. Uh, if at all, it must be something that if Leonardo exaggerates. Uh, with Sumatra, something that he describes as the regular process of visual perception, um, it is certainly in this exaggeration, uh, if you know, that, 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 that character of religiousness. I'm personally convinced that he is an immanentist, that he is uh, not, he's not a dualist. Right? Whatever he tries, the whole trajectory of his thought is to avoid uh, any kind of dualistic uh, thought about uh, the other world and so on, right? And in, there, in, in this case, it's of course, first of all a materialist, but, but within this materialist assumption, there are so many um, striking paradoxes that characterize the material world. And I think that would be his. Uh, perhaps I'm reading him too much. <coughs> No, I'm early by the Benjamin also. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Frank, this is a very painful question. Um, can you tell me, there is a passage, and I think the more I read it, in which the scenario actually simply describes the phenomenon of a of, 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 of body becoming more and more distant. Mm -hmm. And with every increment of distance, it becomes less. Define. Less so rectangular. It becomes a point and then it disappears. <coughs> and I mean, literally, just with the increment of distance, you know, first you have an articulated body and then you know, the articulated body becomes a silhouette and it's the extremity begins to vanish. Mm -hmm. and eventually, you just have kind of a little bowl. Yes. You know, and does he really, does he really, does, does, does he really. Gradation can actually provide that sort of gradation. And I thought that was so wonderful because it literally was from the completeness of something standing right. in front of you to nothingness. Right. It was something that, I mean, you read it, so that the, the world itself being completely incomprehensible in that way. Yeah. I don't remember exactly that he really draws that conclusion that things, this, I mean, he calls it the uh, uh, Prospectiva Dispedition, right? Right. Uh, um, from the rectangle or the irregularly shaped to more and more round forms as you described it. But does he really conclude then at some point that it becomes nothing? I'm not, it disappears and it's not any more visible. Wait, I, didn't talk about I have to. Uh -huh. Does anybody know? It might have been cited by somebody like some, it has Donald been Strong. Uh -huh. I would be interested. Thanks, thanks very much for such an exciting and confusing talk. Just two modest comments, if you can. Um, what you said reminded me a lot of uh, even the principles of Islamic art, in which the point as nothing evolves into a whole labyrinth of universal cosmic meaning, thus the Arabes. It also reminded me a lot about the Fibonacci Bonacci theory from zero, the, the, the invention of the inverted forms of zero evolving into a numeric and regular evolution in our mind. And what is also very much interesting for me is the incredible parallelisms with Kandinsky's written modern times. Kandinsky's work, point, line, and plane, in which he discusses, and this thing in fact discusses, very, very, very parallel to what, excitingly enough, the work can us coming from Leonardo. And just one small question. <coughs> when you do the Euclid, 
I feel it as a sort of contradiction between Da Vinci's philosophy of nothing and Euclidean mathematics, really. I don't know if you can elaborate a bit on this dichotomy. I mentioned it only because uh, 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 Euclid defines the point with a negative uh, uh, assumption, that is that it has no parts, right? So there's already, if you want, the idea that the point is marked by an absence. Uh, it's the, 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 the utmost principle of having, a, having no part. Uh, but it's not related to physical or um, um, optical, whatever, hydrogeological or uh, aesthetic form, of course. It's purely mathematical. Uh, and thank you for the, uh, for your, um, um, for your examples. There's a long prehistory, certainly, for these paradoxes. Well, thank you, but not the same paper. I'm struck by a, a paradox which I would like to comment on. Um, in your starting point, the, the creation of a point is the final contact made with the point of the stylus on the surface. So it's up to the stylus, which of course doesn't make a, a mark in, in the location. I do what I'm getting at is that the paradox of surfaces and towards the end we're talking about Sumato and um, this way in which I think some, it's not only this in Freud, but some of us would perhaps form with a 20th century aesthetic event, which the surface is very important. I have a sort of problem with the analogy of the the, the, the the surface. There's a, there's a sort of contradiction that the surface is all we've got to deal with in the end, but he's trying to deny the surface. Yeah. Or is that incorrect? So what's <coughs> this relation to my point of the surface? Yeah. I would say that sfumato is a <coughs> paradoxical means that at the same time um, <coughs> tries to be even more naturalistic and even more imitative than any kind of abstract depiction of lines. That's his criticism, right? It's not imitatively correct in order to represent a body behind that picture surface. And at the same time, paradoxically, the surface comes back again and Leonardo's paintings seem, seem to be particularly surface related. And at the surface, it's, a, it's an atmosphere that is filled up with matter. So until the very, um, until the very uh, 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 threshold between painting and, and the world, the space of the viewer. Um, and I think in, in, in this, it is again exactly between opacity and transparency. Um, Leonardo does not draw the conclusion that I made at the end that every mark on the picture surface is at the same time both um, something that is behind, signifying something, a body, and a material point of pigment on the picture surface. But I think that would be his conclusion if he would have, if, if he would have been pressed. Right? That then in the 20th century, the concept, of course, disappears with the idea that with the um, um, with the uh, demolition or destruction of the Albertian window as a model for painting, that's not any more model, of course. Well, we, we'll start the general discussion, but let me just thank um, Frank one more time. Thank you.